This is a production of Cornell University. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth. I'm a third year uh, PhD student in plant breeding and genetics. And today I'll be talking about my thesis work focused on understanding the fine scale recombination landscape in maize. So let's start with what is meiotic recombination. Meiotic recombination takes place during meiosis one and at a high level is essentially just shuffling of genetic segments between chromosomes. So as you can see in the schematic, you have two homologous chromosomes, they're paired, they're undergoing an exchange. You zoom in on this area and this is called a double holiday junction. It's the actual site of the exchange. And then eventually the double holiday junction be resolved into a crossover event. And you can see in the homologous chromosomes, they swapped a segment. But recombination is specifically important for plant breeding because it creates novel allelic combinations. And I'll go through a really common situation in which recombination is helpful for plant breeding. So oftentimes you have two lines. Um, one is high yielding, but disease susceptible. And the other is maybe low yielding, but has some disease resistance. So we're trying to integrate that disease resistance into the high yielding elite background. And from that cross, we often want progeny that are high yielding with disease resistance. However, we oftentimes end up with these like medium yielding, but they're disease resistant. And this is due to a phenomenon called linkage drag. So those unwanted yield loci are in close proximity to the disease resistant loci, causing this only the progeny to only have medium yielding. And the problem of linkage drag can really be demonstrated in the maze crossover landscape. So this is chromosome one. Um, and as you can see, it has a very biased distribution. Most crossovers are taking place towards chromosome Ns, towards telomeres. And there's a really large suppression region at the centromere and the region around the centromere called the pericentromeric region. So recently we delve in to see how this landscape correlated with gene density and it correlates pretty well with gene density. However, about 20% of all maize genes are in the pericentromeric region, which means they're consistently not undergoing recombination. So as I mentioned, um, that title, it says we just don't know anything about uh, the fine scale recombination landscape. Um, but I'm interested in understanding at a really fine resolution what's happening with recombination. And the purpose of this is to help inform breeding uh, processes downstream. Um, so if we know what's happening on a really fine scale, that can be used to improve things that um, rely upon recombination, like ETL mapping, but also general breeding programs. However, the data, the crossover data we have right now um, only allows us to do presence abscess pred predictions of crossovers. And to actually estimate recombination rate, we need a really large amount of crossovers. Um, but to do that, obviously, we need really large experimental populations, and that's not always feasible. So to sidestep this, I use historical data to get a really large crossover data set. And the way I went about getting this data set is to use identity by descent analysis, also called the IVD analysis. So IVD analysis essentially just identifies haplotype blocks or unrecombined regions between samples. As you can see, um, the schematic it is two individuals and they share an IVD segment because they have shared ancestry. And over many generations, over lots of recombinations, um, you get smaller and smaller um, segments. But eventually, um, we can still see them. And at the boundaries of them, we can infer them to be past recombination breakpoints. So I did an IBD analysis on 26 diverse maize inbreds with their new de novo assemblies, very high quality, um, and found about 100,000 crossovers for just chromosome one. Um, so this is already fantastic. We have a really large data set. So I went ahead and I did this for all 10 chromosomes of that maze has. And from all of these, you can see the very classic U-shaped distribution that um, maze recombination landscapes um, look like. And you can see also, um, as a proof of concept, chromosome six centromere is way to the left. As you can see, that U is also way to the left. So before this IBD analysis, um, we could only have prediction models that um, was binary classification. And again, it was difficult to assign recombination rate with not a lot of crossovers. 
So after this analysis, we can really explore recombination rate at a really fine scale. And then also in, um, understand what influences recombination rate at a fine scale. So to do this, I constructed, okay, the title says using IPDNs to construct a machine learning model to predict recombination rate. Um, and I had about um, 18 features at 10 KB resolution. And I kind of bend the, the features into different, um, I don't know, classes. So the first of which is histone related. So these are histones and their associated methylation or acetylation, and then DNA methylation related. And um, obviously plants have three types of methylation, but I just want to point out, we included lowest CG interval. Um, if you look at metal plots of crossovers at the midpoint of these crossovers, there's this huge dip in CG methylation, also CHG methylation. And, we, and because we're averaging methylation over the whole 10 KB region, we wanted to um, understand how low can methylation actually go at the midpoint of crossovers. And then the next feature was more chromosome position related. So this has to do more with chromosome dynamics and mechanisms. So distance centromere, distance to the nearest telomere. And then finally, DNA sequence related, which is just gene SNPs and indels. So the model actually does quite well. So the R squared is 0.836. And this is signaling about 83% of the variance of our data could be explained by the model. And the root mean squared error um, is just the error between the predicted and actual values. And we want this as low as possible. But I'll go through the first, uh, the top five, also, this is a feature ranking plot, and it's telling us um, the most predictable features from the model. Um, so the first of which is distance to centromere. And this is really interesting to us because when chromosomes first pair, we think they pair by the telomeres. So when recombination starts, you're going from telomeres into the centromere. And of course, with uh, crossover interference, if you have crossovers forming near chromosome ends, you cannot get them formed during uh, closer to the centromere. So um, this signaling to us that chromosome dynamics might be at play is really interesting. Um, and the same goes for distance to nearest telomere. But then we also have some um, things that like CG, CHG, and nucleosome occupancy, which are all signaling to us um, some features about open chromatin have to do with um, predicting recombination. So I wanted to see what the most, the least amount of features we can have and still get good prediction. So actually you only need five features to um, explain the same amount of variance. So actually the R squared went up a little bit to 0.8642. And this is the, um, the model, um, the best model I am saying. Um, so distance to centromere, CHG, CHG methylation and distance nearest telomere and acusome occupancy are um, all you need really to um, predict recombination rate. Um, and to compare this to the binary model, and that is just the presence absence uh, model, you can see there's different feature rankings. Um, so this is, if, um, this is a plot from the binary prediction model. You can see the, the, the feature that explains the most variance is SNP density. However, um, that's not even in the top five for our recombination rate model. Um, so we think that recombination rate in particular, rather than just binary prediction of crossovers, uh, may be influenced by chromosome dynamics with um, distances to centromere and telomere um, being one of the biggest features. So in summary, I utilize historical data to obtain a really large amount of crossovers and then use that large data set to predict recombination rate at a 10 KB resolution. I just wanna stress, we have never been able to predict recombination rate. Um, so the fact that we not only have great data, but also are able to do it is already fantastic. Um, and I just like to thank my lab for supporting me and my mentors and also NSFNRT for my funding sources. Thank you. And I can take any question. Yes, yes. Yeah, so the question is, what are chromosome dynamics? So it's a broad term, but basically I'm talking about mechanistically what's happening with chromosomes during 
actual meiosis. So a lot of it are just hypotheses that we have about how chromosomes pair, at what point they make double strand breaks. Um, so this model is kind of like a sidestep to actually doing a lot of wet lab things to look at how chromosomes are actually interacting with each other and how they're undergoing uh, recombination. So I'd say it's like an umbrella term for just like mechanistically what are chromosomes doing. Yes, Jim. So our, our distance to centromere and from centromere and distance from telomere, are those really independent measurements? If they were point estimates, they wouldn't be, would they? But there's probably slop in there. Measurement is that what the issue is? Yeah, so eventually, okay, so the question was what's the difference between distance to centromere and distance to nearest telomere? They should be telling us the same things. Um, we agree. Um, we hope to one day combine them into like maybe a ratio of distance to telomere, distance to centromere. But I also think the um, so this model was trained on all 10 chromosomes. So each of them obviously have different orientations of where the centromere is and um, I don't know, other chromatin differences between the chromosomes. Um, so I think it has to do with, there's two telomeres and the distances to each centromere is not always the same. We've tried to scale it, um, but that hasn't really made a difference in the model. Yeah, we'd eventually like to combine them. So it's just one term. Chromosome one seems to be a certain anomaly in that long end chromosome one has a lot of recombination. It's a big block. It's not just spread at the telomere. Do you have any explanation for that? Yeah. Okay, so the question was what's going on with chromosome one? I'll show this figure. So you have this like suppression and then it goes up again and it goes down again a little bit. So what we think is actually this is at the point in which crossover interference like stops working. So like if you have crossovers forming over here, then they go, okay, like we're far away enough. We can form crossovers here and then the suppression of the centromere. And from the analysis we did, you can kind of see a lot of chromosomes behave like that. So you kind of have this like bump at some point because a lot of chromosomes have a long arm and then they have a short arm. So we think it has to do with crossover interference. Okay, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.